This December, Outshine Film Festival's Fort Lauderdale Virtual Edition, featuring queer films from all over the world. Presenting 18 feature films and three shorts programs, plus a drive-in movie night at Pier 66. Watch the best LGBTQ plus films from home. Tickets are on sale now. Check out the program at OutshineFilm.com. Hello, I'm Jennifer Kritz, the Vice Chair of Outshine Film Festival, and welcome to the Q&A for The Whistle, showing now at Outshine Virtual Film Festival, Fort Lauderdale edition. Today we have Storm Miguel Flores, the director, Annalise Orphelian, the co-producer and director of photography, and Havens Levitt, who is one of the subjects of the documentary, is the teacher. Uh, Storm Miguel and Annalise and uh, Havens, welcome. Welcome to Outshine. Hi there. And congratulations Hello. on your film. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We're so excited to screen at Outshine. Wonderful. So Storm Miguel and Annalise, uh, you've worked together on several projects, most notably Major, which is a documentary on Miss Major Griffin Gracie, the trans woman activist. Congratulations, by the way, on all of your awards. Um, and you're a couple. Uh, tell me about coming together to make film. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Annalise made me in her basement. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's there's a moment for couples when you're filmmakers when you make a decision do you want to be a relationship where someone is a film widow which is to say that when you're in the production and post-production project process the non-filmmaking partner is just like bye see you later so we want to engage in the process of collaborating together and we decided that um we really love collaborating together to make film uh and so we've had the opportunity to work on each other's projects a few times now and it's and it's really great and a gift and uh we each i think have our own areas that we focus in it was really exciting to see storm direct his first feature and to get to be in that sort of support role as his uh, camera operator and, and getting to really just like watch his vision come to life on this one. And Star Miguel, you enjoy working with Annalise? So much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I mean, we, we really, it's interesting because I think we see a lot of time, like, you know, there are couples that are like in COVID who are sheltering in place together who have never spent this much time together and are just like, what? I need today. And we're so used to like spending time together. We work together at the same mm -hmm. table across from each other. We've been working together this way for years yeah. and we get to travel together and, um, and you know, work together that way. And it's just uh, really um, exciting to get to do this with like my favorite person in the world. Yeah, it's really wonderful. We work well together. We have very similar um, vision and, and kind of work ethics. I feel like I've really learned so much um, about doing filmmaking in a way that feels less colonizing, you know, documentary filmmaking um, from watching Annalise work with, rather than like, we don't even really use the word, like we don't like the word subjects because we feel like people are participants because we want them to be participants in their own stories. And mm -hmm. that feels really important, especially for groups that normally don't get to tell our stories, right? And so um, learning that from Annalise has just been such an amazing gift and it's been really fun to get to implement that as much as possible. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up because um, I was looking at um, some stuff from Annalise and I was noticing that uh, she says, film work focuses on decolonizing the documentary filmmaking process by centering participants as key collaborators in the storytelling process and is informed by the principles of interpretive phenomenological analysis. We have a very smart audience. Um, I'm sure they'll understand that completely, but would you elaborate on it more for me Mm -hmm. uh, Annalise, and tell me a little bit more about your process because you do have a very unique style in uh, in presenting uh, film with with participants. Sure. Well, and it's, and I think we can speak on this to the whistle because this was 
how the whistle came about as well. So I'm, a, um, I'm by training a clinical psychologist. Uh, IPA is a qualitative research methodology, and I think it works really well for documentary. It's essentially saying, rather than going into a documentary story with a preconceived idea of what it is and what it's about, what happens if we go into a story with curiosity and openness and ask a question, what's this experience like for you? Like, tell us about you. And then the process involves in post-production, kind of transcribing and going through everything that people tell you, tell us, um, letting that drive the narrative, uh, and then bringing it back to the folks that you talk to on camera with the question, did I get this right? Like often in documentary, we're talking with folks in interviews for an hour, an hour and a half, six or seven or eight minutes of that show up on screen. There's a mm -hmm. huge amount of subjectivity that goes into editing. And so when you bring the folks on camera, on screen, into the editing process to say, am I hearing this right? Like what I think I'm hearing you say is this, is that in fact it? Taking those course corrections that folks are like, no, actually that, that doesn't actually capture the meaning or I think this thing I said over here was more important. It allows that lens to really center what's authentic and important to the person you talked to. Uh, and I know a lot of filmmakers kind of freak out about that process. Sorry, our dog's gonna walk back and forth between us occasionally. Um, <laughs> Chacha is a you know, ch production chihuahua is integral. <laughs> but what it loves, allows us to do is really feel like when you go to opening night, when that film shows up on screen, you know you've really made a story that is from the perspectives and about the people who are on camera. Um, and particularly in LGBTQ documentary filmmaking, you know, I think our communities have historically been really otherized and are seen through outsider lenses. So it's really important for us to be sure that that lens is actually coming from the perspective of the folks telling the story. Well, a major component of this film is to preserve the history of Albuquerque lesbians and their cultures and their customs and the importance of this secret code for survival and identification. Um, this is certainly the first film I've seen about, you know, really doing a deep dive on Albuquerque um, in this fashion. Whose idea was it and, and how did you guys decide this was the project that you needed to do? Well, it was a, a series of conversations with, um, so Charlene, who's in the documentary and her partner, Aaron, um, and I tend to see each other every time I go home to visit. And um, Charlene and I kind of, Grew up together in that at that time, and so we'll have conversations a lot about people we know and things we did, and you know, just who's doing what now and how we did it then. And um, her partner was always very fascinated, and always just like, "Wait, tell me more. I don't understand. I came out in the '90s in the Midwest, and I didn't have anything like this." And so, as we had these conversations, eventually, it was just like, "There, there needs to be a book, or there need this needs to be out there." And Aaron was telling Sharon that we needed to do something. And eventually Aaron was like, wait, make a movie and make a documentary about it. And I didn't really know that there was a documentary when she talked about it. I was just like, I don't, I don't know, you know, maybe you do it and I'll, we'll help you. Like, cause you're the one that has all the questions. And so we went back and forth with that for a while and I hemmed and hawed and eventually I brought it to Annalise and Annalise was like, yes, make a documentary about this. And you know, I'd love to shoot it. And so, that, that's it. I didn't think I wanted to direct. I wasn't, I, I'm an editor and that's what I enjoy, but I had an amazing time editing, uh, directing this project. And Havens, tell me, how did you get involved as one of the participants of this project? Well, I have known Storm Miguel, you know, since basic geometry in 1980 something, whatever. Um, and we had stayed in touch a little bit and then actually uh, he brought Major to Albuquerque. And so we kind of reconnected a little bit more uh, significantly around that experience because I was uh, trying to help make that happen. And so when he asked me, you know, did I want to talk about those years? Of course, I was all in. I was excited to be part of it. Well, you have a very large impact, I would imagine, on so many of uh, people at that time as a school teacher. And uh, I have a couple of questions about that. The first part is, what was that like for you? Did you ever have any fears that your um, assistants could be possibly uh, turned against you in some way? 
And the second part is, did you have any idea the enormous impact you were making on these people? I definitely had fear, no doubt about that. I, I started teaching in 82 after having been in a job where nobody cared that I was a lesbian and I was, um, you know, pretty out. And so when I started teaching, I definitely uh, went back into the closet and kind of just thought I need to figure out how to make this work. Uh, but I did say to myself from day one, I'll never refuse to uh, acknowledge who I am to a student that needs to know that that's who I am. So it kind of evolved in terms of um, me finding my footing as a teacher and kind of getting my confidence. And, um, and then this wonderful group of young women kind of showed up in my life in a way that was kind of, we both together uh, supported each other and found a way to be there for each other. You know, I just remember walking down the hall and seeing a little group of dykes and, you know, we would just have this kind of nodding wink and, made my day, you know, made me feel better about being at school every day. Um, so I, you know, it took me a few years, I think, to find, figure it out. And then I, at some point I decided, you know, what can they do to me? They can't really, as an old partner used to say, they can't take your birthday away. So I'm just going to do what, do what I, be honest, because that's uh, who I try to be. In terms of, um, the impact, I think, in some ways I was aware, uh, only in subtle ways. And then as more students graduated and felt a little more comfortable, I would definitely have students come back and, and tell me, you know, what that, you know, what a difference it had made for there to be an announcement on the announcements, you know, once a week that said the Del Norte Lesbian and Gay Support Group is meeting in room 401 at noon. Um, so I, I hoped that it was making a difference. And, you know, I'm with Listen, which actually works in K through 12 schools. And one of the protective factors that we know really makes a difference for kids is there being supportive adults that are identifiable and that, and that young people know who they can go to for support. So. Wow. Well, I'm, you know, I think that you have so much to be proud of in listening to the different participants talking in the documentary. You can see the huge impact that you had. And uh, by the way, I love how in the documentary, plenty of your participants were sent to uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. And in every example, the therapist says, you're fine. It's your parents who need to adjust. And, uh, you know, speak, speak to that a little bit, Annalise, as a psychotherapist. Uh, when did, it feels like the therapist got on board with uh, it's okay to be gay way before um, the general population did. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of those really ex amazing moments in production when you don't know what people are gonna tell you and these stories kept kind of coming up and coming up and Storm and I would kind of be like looking at each other like from behind the camera being like, God, the first thing I think of is there was a clinical training director somewhere at you know, University of New Mexico or in one of the clinical training programs in and around Albuquerque that really did a huge service to a tremendous number of people uh, in Albuquerque by clearly teaching that um, conversion therapy was not the way and that there, you know, that a, a LGBT affirmative mental health care was an important tact. Um, and I think that we so often hear the sort of um, conversion horror stories and being able to see it framed from the perspective of this is the kind of positive impact that responsible mental health care can have was an interesting and unplanned sort of message that came through in the film. Do you yeah. think you it was it was a big surprise for sure. Um, you know, I think I, I think my dog is about to start barking now. And because um, that was also my story, and I really thought my story. Yes, I can. I thought my story was really unique. Like I really didn't think I was going to hear that from what three other participants. Mm -hmm. And so sitting in the, you know, the director chair, just trying to keep a straight face because my, my mouth wanted to just drop to the ground hearing these stories. 
um, it was very exciting to, to know that that happened for other people. Not that they had to get go through that, but that the outcome was what it was. Because it really could have been a different story if, you know, there, that, you know, ha had there been, if conversion therapy was the, what was being taught, we would have, that would have fallen on all of us, people, you know, who you heard from and you may probably wouldn't have heard from us. Right. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was a really surprise. It was a surprise, one of the biggest surprises in making the documentary. So tell me a little about the whistle itself. Um, Havens, do you know it? Can you do it? That's because I was an old person, right? Why did they to me? I mean... Star Miguel? Yes, yes. You're a very talented singer, too. So I would assume you should be able to do the whistle. <laughs> so before I do the whistle, I it, it took a long time to learn. And I think that was one of the reasons that we were able to use it in the way we did because it wasn't just something everybody did. We like most people I know like had to like learn it, had to spend time. I spent two weeks solid annoying my friends every single day being like, is that, is that it? Is that it? Is that it? And I eventually got it. And then I annoyed them because I wouldn't stop doing it. And it, it was a really, a, it was a practice and it was like, it took dedication and wanting to do it. So it really made for a very unique sound um, and signal for us to be able to, to use with each other. Is it? Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear that over the um, this <laughs> over the Chihuahua. Over the Chihuahua. Yes, the Chihuahua heard that. By the way, the Chihuahuas are like. <laughs> so, um, is this unique to Albuquerque? Because I did notice in the documentary, it seems to stem possibly from Mexico. So the the whistle among lesbians is unique to Albuquerque, I believe. I I feel very confident in saying that's very unique to Albuquerque. Um, as we learn in the film, um, it there's a lineage and it maybe has different meanings in different places. I don't necessarily want to give it away, but uh, it does. There is there are a group of people that talk about that they would hear men in the mercado use the whistle to signal each other. <clears throat> and from my understanding, it was like signal 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 them that like the a customer's coming or it wasn't necessarily a queer thing. I don't know. Uh -huh. right? Who knows? This is a whole other documentary um, mm -hmm. that could be made. And then it. It, it the film talks about where it went, you know, where we think it went next, or it, as far as how we know, it traveled to us, right? And so um, we do find out a little bit about where the whistle came, how the whistle came directly to us from that point of origin, next place, and then to us. And I, I don't want to give it away for folks who haven't seen it. It's not like a big reveal or anything. We weren't even sure that we would get the answer when I when we knew that we wanted to center it around the whistle in some way, just so we would have a, a place to start. Um, honestly, I thought we would ask people about the whistle, get a lot of stories about them being queer and out and never really find the answer to the whistle because back then we were asking and we didn't get the answer. And so it was really a pleasant and wonderful surprise to learn more about where the whistle came from and, and actually have a person to point it to who was kind of the gateway into bringing it into to our community. One of the topics you bring up, which I think is so important, and uh, I'm and certainly not unique to Albuquerque, is this, while it was a secret culture in a way of gays in the 80s and 90s and a little, you know, avoiding raids and, and all of that, now that there's so much acceptance, all of the gay clubs, and lesbian clubs have disappeared. And these were places that were not just about hiding. Uh, in fact, they became almost not at all about hiding. They became very obvious that these were places, especially in the 90s and 2000s, that they were, I mean, you could go pick up almost any magazine and find out where they were. It was a culture in and of itself for us to, to congregate. And a lot of that is gone now because people are so integrated. Uh, and you touch on this quite a bit uh, in your documentary. Um, tell me more about how that has affected you personally. Uh, Storm Miguel, let's start with you. I definitely miss those, those spaces a lot. I don't need them as much, I miss them. I miss them culturally very much, mm -hmm. I'm wrong for that. I don't need it as much. And I do feel like, you know, as we grew older, 
the bars weren't necessary. We weren't going to the bars as much, right? People kind of couple off and do their thing and they're working and things just kind of, as we grow older, we're maybe not going out partying as much. And I think people who've come up after us are hanging out, like young people aren't, they're not necessarily just partying, like young queer people aren't just necessarily partying with other queer people. Um, I feel like, you know, people hang out with different people. In school, we all hung out with each other and maybe had a couple friends who were straight, but I feel like more people are kind of just like integrated a little bit more just as far as like who you're spending time with. And so you're not necessarily going to just gay bars. People go out to a bar, they go out and, and they can be with, you know, their partner and it's okay. And they can, and it's, you know, it's a little, I think it, it tends to be a little more mixed now. Um, and so the, the need is less Then we needed a place to congregate, to be safe. Even though we weren't in secret, we needed a, con a place to congregate and be safe to celebrate just openly who we, who we, who we were, who we are. And so, you know, I think, I don't know that it's, it's affected me negatively. I know that I do miss that particular culture, but I feel like I've held on to queer culture in a really deep way and it's shifted and changed over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about either of you? I mean, at least you're, you're in San Francisco. We're in San Francisco and one of the things, and I moved, so I moved to San Francisco 27 years ago from um, Providence, Rhode Island, where I was going to college. And I lived out in Seattle before that. And you move to San Francisco feeling like, oh, you're moving to like, you know, the sort of the, the, the home base of, of queer culture in the United States. And I have to say that I missed immediately those smaller town, queer communities. And when I go to Albuquerque today, and certainly hearing the historical stories, I think that we tend to flatten or idealize queer social spaces as really belonging to San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago. And I think that that's not the best cross-section, actually, of the real richness and robustness of what regional queer communities historically and currently look like in this country. So I love hearing all of the stories that we heard during these interviews. And I, I love the queer community because of that richness, because sometimes being smaller also means that the spaces are more hard fought and won. There's certainly more mix, I feel like, within those spaces. Um, San Francisco cannot keep a lesbian bar open. Um, and they haven't been able to in the 27 years that I've lived here. Uh, I had better like dyke social spaces outside of San Francisco for sure. So I, I like stories like this as a way also, I think of celebrating and honoring um, more regional queer communities and spaces and, and really being able to say, no, we should be listening outside of just these big over covered um, metropolitan areas because like Albuquerque queer community has a lot to show us. What about you Havens? Do you miss it? Did you ever go? Oh, yes. I mean, in the 80s, there were four lesbian bars in Albuquerque. <laughs> and we have zero now. Yeah. I totally, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a bar person. I'm kind of like Storm Miguel said, you know, I've been with my partner for almost 25 years and we're, you know, 67 and 70. And that's not necessarily our scene. But I, I think that queer culture is so... Um, vital to a sense of our place and our way to connect with each other that I, it makes me very sad. You know, we don't have a community center in Albuquerque. We have one uh, gay bar that closed, almost closed, and, and it's kind of a longer story, but they did a big fundraising thing. And I think they are going to survive. That's been around a long time, but there just isn't that, you know, I've had a recent conversation with some people about assimilation versus, you know, the opposite. We, I don't want to assimilate. I want there to be a strong sense of us having our own ways of being in the world because we do. And they're really uh, precious to me. So I, I, uh, I, if there were a lesbian bar, I'd go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, that's true. I, I would. I mean, I, I miss the kind of how much how well, like the way that it brought us together, like so kind of how concentrated we were. But I do feel like we still have those spaces. They're not. They don't look like they're not necessarily bars. Like definitely, we have some bars here that are queer. They're very queer. We love to support them. We never go. Like we, we go a couple times a year, um, but we love that they're there. We love that they exist. And 
one of the things that communities are doing though, they're creating other kinds of spaces. It's not just bars. We have the room now to create, um, you know, more artistic spaces. And th those were happening then. Havens um, and I were a part of, and Havens was like one of the, the founder, I believe, of Women Fest, which was a lesbian music festival that happened in Albuquerque. How many years did it run, Havens? Um, over 20. Over 20 years. Close to 25, I think, yeah. And that was uh, that was a very important cultural piece of of Albuquerque um, lesbian uh, uh, life. There, that went on for years, and every and it wasn't just the annual festival; it was a, you know musical and performance events throughout the year. And that's where I learned how to do pr uh, pr production, event production, and and um, in a way that was really um, accessible to community, accessible around around needs, um, access needs. Um, and yeah, I just, I learned so much from that. So that was happening then too. And I feel like there's a lot of that happening now. There's just like, there's more of it. There's more of it. There's a lot of places for us to gather around arts, around, um, activism and, and the bars are not the only place. Those are definitely a great place to go and celebrate and be together as well. And, and they still exist on some level. Yeah. I miss them because you used to go on um, whatever night and you didn't have to call all your friends and say, do you want to go? Everyone just went. And so it was a great opportunity to just connect with so many of your friends, whether you were single or not single, and whether you wanted to dance or just have one drink and stop by. I mean, it was just, you know, it, it was a cultural institution in so many places and, and I miss it for that reason. So the next uh, and final thing I want to talk about is the very important call to action that you have at the uh, near the end of the film, which is about not being complacent and the new generation. Um, tell me a little bit more, uh, Storm Miguel and Annalise, how that developed in your in your uh, documentary. Yeah, it, it felt a little. Um, it felt important to talk about where we're at now. It just felt important. It's so we're so acutely aware of the kind of tentativeness of our basic rights. We've been teetering for so long. We're like, yes, we're we're here. No, we're not. And we're never really here until all of us are, you know, so we're really looking at all aspects of our community. It's not just about gay marriage, right? But I think that right now, because our we're being so acutely attacked and trying and and prevented from from moving forward, or, or there's that, you know, be, the tr community's trying to, community, conservatives were trying to prevent us from actually moving forward. And um, they we're being attacked. Like we're being attacked like so many others and all of the ways that we intersect, we're being attacked. And that's, it felt important to talk about that because that's the moment we're in. And I feel like we have so much to learn from youth. I feel like, mm -hmm. I don't feel like youth are complacent. I feel like I'm learning so much every day from people who are younger than me and helping me to to get out of my own kind of way of thinking that I think is the right way because, you know, I've done it this way and that's the way it's done. I just feel like I, I'm constantly learning from younger people than me and the dedication to um, coalition building and movement building is just phenomenal with um, younger people. I do think, Annalise. I think there's a huge, I mean, like, you know, we, we filmed during this last administration and I think that the impact of four years of this administration is so deeply felt in so many communities that experience systemic marginalization. Um, it's, you know, old issues, historic issues in this country that have been put into sharp, sharp relief and become even more acute in the last four years. Um, and, and I think that, so that was very on the front of people's minds as they were talking like, wow, for the first time since like the seventies and eighties, I'm starting to feel that like the government structures are really actively looking for ways to like harm me and the people that I love. And I think that the administration shift in January is not going to actually change that. Uh, and so I think the part of the call for action that persists sadly, um, throughout future viewings of this film is that our court system is now set up in ways that we're going to be feeling for the rest of our lives um, that have already had an impact in terms of, for instance, conversion therapy being considered a First Amendment protected um, form of institutionalized torture and harm. Uh, that we're looking at these ways in which that battle against systems is so perpetual in queer and trans lives. Um, 
And I agree with Storm that I, I feel like youth leadership is where I look to. I also feel like elder leadership is where I look to, that there's an intergenerational coalition building tact that is informed by the way that white supremacy specifically intersects queer and trans lives, is informed by the most vulnerable in our communities, which is to say black trans women. Um, and, and looking at the ways in which the survival needs that we have always, I think as a community creatively found ways to persevere and survive through. Don't go away because you've got someone in office that is not like saying they're gonna like outwardly lobby against your rights, that, that these are battles we've always fought and that we wax and wane and we go through moments of being like, all right, time to pick that mantle back up again. Um, so yeah, I think that call to action is when we look back, it's impossible to not then look at today and see the ways in which we're still being called to to fight for the basic survival and human dignities that queer and trans communities have always fought for. Havens, hey uh, do you feel that the younger generation as they grow up being much more accepting of those uh, around them, do you think we have the the hope that um, Albuquerque and and all of America are going to uh, transition uh, gently <laughs> into the future? Well, I like um, Storm said, you know, I am very um, impressed by and look to young people to um, help me. I mean, you know, I'm, um, I'm one of those people who I feel like I'm uh, on my learning edge all the time because young people are so much more, um, well, they're just living in a different universe than the one I lived in. And I want to be open to that, which isn't always true for some of my uh, elder peers. But I think that they um, provide a lot of um, just a new perspective that, in some ways, because they, that kind of awful stuff that happened to queer people in the 40s and 50s and 60s, it's it's not, there's other things that are happening now that need us to think a little differently about how to move forward. Um, and I, I think for one thing, just the fact that we finally are at a point where so many more people are accepting the intersectionality of all of these issues and understanding the ways in which uh, white supremacy and homophobia and transphobia all are part of the same, um, dare I say, patriarchal system. <laughs> um, I think it gives me hope. Absolutely. And the other thing well, I want to point out is that um, 30 or 40 years ago, I did learn from Storm Miguel how to uh, roll the sleeve on my T-shirt so that it looked cool. <laughs> I don't do that. I just want to say, I don't know if he if he remembers spending yeah. time with me. We got, you know, your short sleeve t-shirt needs it needs some work 80s, to work. It was the 80s yeah. and early early 90s, 80s was very important. It was so essential. Good. It's a lesson that has stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, on that note. <laughs> Um, thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Storm Miguel Flores. Thank you, Annalise Ophelian and Havens Levitt. Thank you for discussing your historic documentary of The Whistled, which is now playing at Outshine Fort Lauderdale 2020. And if you don't already have them, make sure you get your tickets today at outshinefilm.com. And now we're going to end with the trailer for The Whistle. Thank you so much. See you virtually at the movies. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can you just try to do The Whistle? Okay, okay. You just try to do... See nothing. I don't even remember the first time we learned it or the first time I learned it. I yeah. don't remember at all. I was always just like, who started this? Who started this? This is so cool. And nobody knew. I don't recall exactly how I learned it. I have no idea where the whistle came from. It's an Albuquerque myth. Albuquerque was packed of queers. We were from all over the city. There were 10 high schools at the time, and yet we all knew each other. I remember at some point having some conversations about, oh my gosh, did you know that such and such was, was gay? Did yeah, you know? so we were like, like yeah. oh. This person is not just my friend. 
this is my girlfriend. And I was like, yes. We would congregate at parties or at games. There were some after hour clubs that under 18 could go. I'll never forget the first time I went to one and 30 or 40 different people that I saw from other high schools were there. At the time we used the whistle. Using the whistle was a little indication to whoever I was whistling to that I'm a lesbian too. It was part of our secret code. It was part of the language that we used in order to, gosh, I guess it was to protect ourselves. We were still in the closet. I mean, we still had to be careful on who kind of found out about us. We knew that there was a line, and don't go past that line. What would it have been like if I would have been born into a world where I could be exactly who I am and be celebrated for that? The priest told me pretty much not to worry about it, that this is a phase. Well, you know, here it is 40 years later, and I'm still living out this phase. <laughs>